Welcome to the third lecture in the series on uh, antimicro um, antimicrobials and antibiotics. Um, if you recall at the end of the last lecture, we were discussing the beta-lactam class of uh, antibiotics, including penicillin and um, um, other variants. Um, the first few slides of this lecture, we will look at um, the carbapenems before going on to look in detail at um, how bacteria um, evolve resistance. So we look at resistance both at a microbiological, evolutionary, and chemical level. So the carbapenems are the last of a kind of subclass of beta-lactams. They have a basic beta-lactam structure that you see here and from the ring. You'll note they lack um, the side chain here that, we, that, we, uh, that we're familiar with in the, in the penicillins. And we have a five-membered ring here, but note we still have a couple of sinic acid group here. But instead we do have this longer chain group here onto this uh, file. So imipenem and all the copper penems, so like the beta lactams have a similar mode of action, they bind for penicillin binding protein like we saw before. Um, what's different, however, is that imipenem um, has a different uh, um, antimicrobial spectrum. I'll we'll look at this in a short moment. Um, one issue is that there's already copper penem resistance. Um, Copper penems have a reputation of being the drug of last resort. They have to be IV administered. But you see here, this is a graph now from 2009, but in Eastern Europe, there's widespread resistance. Um, less so in Scandinavia, um, still moderate resistance in the UK, Ireland, Germany, um, and France. Um, the lowest areas, in fact, are Denmark and the Netherlands, for reasons probably to do with how uh, nursing care is provided. Incidentally, this uh, ECDC uh, website down here, lots of interesting data on uh, antimicrobial resistance, including these maps that you can download pretty much for any uh, drug you might, or um, bacteria that you might be interested in. So the cephalosporins are the final class of the beta-lactam antibiotic. Note again, the beta-lactam ring, um, very structurally similar to penicillin, except we have a six-membered ring. We have a file, uh, sulfur here still uh, adjacent to the ring. The amide, and in fact, there should be, and I'll just draw it in here, an amide here. This is slightly missing from this, uh, this sketch for some reason, so I'll just draw in the uh, double bond oxygen from amide there. Okay. So the cephalosporin um, SAR relationship is, uh, um, uh, as I already said, regards the bicyclic ring, the beta lactam uh, central component here, the form of the ring. Capsidic acid here, um, here I should say, um, and the amide uh, chain onto the side chain. And structurally, it looks similar to a cysteine, valinine, amino acids put together, which is, might be how it's recognised by the uh, penicillin binding protein. Um, it's possible to do modification, of course, of cephalosporins particularly with side chain with a number of different variants added. Um, and this can make the uh, drugs more or less effective against uh, gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria. Um, I don't suggest you get overly bogged down in detail here, just be aware that various chemical modifications can be used to change the uh, pharmacological and antimicrobial properties. Okay, part five of this lecture is um, really to think about in detail how uh, bacteria evolve resistance to antibiotics. And I really want to understand this uh, both at a um, whole cell level, but then drill down into um, a molecular understanding of how resistance is um, comes about. And part of this, we're going to look at Staphylococcus aureus as a case study um, with a fairly famous or infamous methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus as a, uh, as, a, as a good story to look at. So as we all know, antibacterial therapy has been a victim of its own success. Um, it has been tremendously, tremendously successful at um, halting deaths from pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis, etc. Um, and as we've already seen, the turning point has been production of the discovery of penicillin and the commercial um, mass production of penicillin. But in the 1980s, pharma companies began reducing development of new antibiotics, wasn't much money to be made, arguably still isn't. 
um, combined with the overuse of antibiotics, both clinically, but also in agriculture. Um, in many countries in the world, you can still get, you can now get antibiotics without prescription, um, has led to uh, evolution of widespread resistance. And this potentially could be a, a huge crisis of the next 30 years. And to think in general terms, um, uh, epidemi epidemiologists look at um, so-called MDR to XTR to PDR for, this, for different uh, towards the post-antibiotic era. MDR stands for multi-drug resistance. It's a bacteria which are resistant to a large number of different drugs. But normally there are still some uh, antibiotics left behind that will kill them. Uh, likewise, XTR and then pan-drug resistance is really where we don't want to be. Um, example of um, multi-drug resistance comes from, for example, the NDM1 um, protein, which we'll come on to and discuss in more detail. NDM1 confers resistance to couple penems. And then MCR1 confers resistance to polymixins of coli um, um, strict cholestin. And both these have already been seen. MD, um, NDM1 resistance was seen in 2010 and MCR1 in 2016. So I've already discussed uh, why um, antibiotic misuse develops resistance. Um, and I won't really repeat myself here. Um, I would say that agriculture and the need to give um, animals antibiotics to keep them healthy in intensive farming conditions is a big part of the problem in my view. So the general mechanism of microbial drug resistance can be understood. Um, a bacteria can exclude a drug, so it prevents the uh, uh, drug uh, binding or penetrating inside the bacterial cell. It can try and pump the drug out um, and it can, or it can inactivate the drug um, by a modification of a drug by enzymes within the, within the bacteria itself, or it can alter the, the molecular or enzymatic drug target such that it's no longer affected by that drug. Um, or it can uh, develop alternative pathways for making a target metabolite. And we'll see examples pretty much of all these as we go. On. So how do bacteria acquire genes which confer antibiotic resistance. Remember, a gene is information that tells the ribosome to make a protein. And it's these proteins which are fundamentally confer resistance. So there's three principal routes. Um, in some cases, the gene, the antimicrobial resistant gene, is present in the general microbial population, but is not seen extensively, maybe one in a million, one in a billion. And in normal conditions, when the antibiotics are not being used, there's no um, evolutionary advantage for those bacteria with that gene to, uh, to develop more than, their, uh, more than their brothers or sisters. But when you start killing off all the bacteria which don't have that particular gene, then clearly the, resistant, the naturally resistant bacteria will come to the fore and quickly, uh, quickly take over. And that's uh, uh, evolution by, by uh, natural selection in action, very easy to um, see and even model um, in the lab. Um, in addition, uh, once a, uh, a bacteria with a particular res resistance gene um, is uh, in the general population and is kind of doing well, you can easily pass that gene down to um, its, uh, its progeny. This is called vertical gene transfer. That's from, from, from the parental line to next generation and so on and so on and so on. Providing that gene provides um, uh, a evolutionary advantage for that, that bacteria and it will continue to be passed on. And obviously all the time that we can, uh, have antibiotics in uh, our natural environment and inside us, then there's a strong selection pressure for that gene to uh, continue to be passed down the line. And the other third alternative is you can have so-called horizontal gene transfer. Um, which is by uh, uh, where bacteria can pass uh, genes between each other within a generation. This can be either bacteria to bacteria, or by um, bacteria can pick up small plasmids, which are small round bits of DNA, or we can acquire uh, genes via viruses, which can actually uh, bind to bacteria and directly inject um, resistant genes into them. And we'll look at these examples.
This vertical gene transfer um, is the first uh, thing. Is it should be understood that spontaneous mutation happens in all cells, indeed in all of us, and it happens um, at all about one in a hundred million to one in hundred, uh, one in a billion. Um, it's a fairly rare event, but if it's a spontaneous, and most mutations actually damage bacteria, so the bacterial line stops. But occasionally, very occasionally, that um, mutation can be advantageous for a bacteria, and that means it can somehow, um, just by random chance, uh, acquire a, a different gene, a mutant gene, which gives it um, a, an advantage over its progeny. For example, antimicrobial resistance. And once these resistance genes have developed, as I already said, they can be passed down, down the line uh, in this process known as vertical gene transfer. So this is really uh, Darwinian evolution in action and um, strongly recommend that you all go and read Richard Dawkins's book, uh, The Selfish Gene, which is probably the best description of Darwinian evolution I've ever read in my life. And I recommend it to you thoroughly. But I'll put some links on the, on the uh, website later. Um, once a bacteria with a mutant gene is in the environment, um, that environment will start to select for uh, bacteria which have a, a advantage, an evolutionary advantage. So clearly, if you have lots of antibiotics in the, in the environment and a bacteria has an antibiotic resistant gene, that um, mutant bacteria will uh, go on to survive and do well. A wild type of non-mutants will be killed off. In that way, we rapidly go from a very small number of resistant bacteria to a very large number of resistant bacteria within a population. Horizontal gene transfer is the process, as I said, of whereby uh, genes can be passed within a generation. Um, and it's an important mechanism by which uh, bacteria can spontaneously pick up mutant genes. Um, and we'll look at these some examples. There are three basic mechanisms so called transduction, transformation, or conjugation. So conjugation is sort of direct cell cell contact between two bacteria. The interesting thing is they don't necessarily need to be the same species. Uh, they can be quite different species, but as long as they can transfer uh, DNA across in the plasmid form, these small rings of DNA, this can be a, a, an effective way of, a, of a horizontal gene transfer taking place. Transformation is where bits of DNA are taken up by the bacteria from the external environment. That's bits of free floating DNA, um, perhaps which are just there, present in the uh, liquid in which they're living due to the um, death and destruction of other cells in which they are um, living with. So, frequency mutation, um, as we already said, spontaneous mutation happens in about one in a billion replicated base pairs which translates to about one in a million replicated genes. That's just a spontaneous natural process due to radiation or whatever that just causes this. Um, mutagens, uh, which is, are either chemicals or, for example, radiation or even heat, can increase from one, um, can increase this rate of replication from one in 10 to the six to one in 10 to the five, a tenth of a tenfold uh, increase in a uh, mut mutation rate. Um, most mutations are disadvantageous and the bacteria dies, but very so often um, a positive selection um, gives confers an advantage to bacteria. And as we already have uh, discussed, it causes the um, uh, it can cause competition and non-resistant bacteria don't do well in that competitive environment, and the uh, mutated bacteria uh, grow on and thrive. And in most cases, it's for drug resistant bacteria present in the population prior to exposure to antibiotics, and it's antibiotics then which uh, provide the selection pressure um, for the uh, drug resistant bacteria to, to flourish. So, just as a recap, vertical gene transfer occurs during reproduction between generations of cells, um, down the line, horizontal gene transfer between cells of the same generation. So here's, here's a, a concept of transduction where bacteria pick up 
small bits of DNA um, floating around from uh, donor cells or just from the soup in which they, li they live. And then you see here on the left, these are bit DNA fragments, say for gene A and gene B, gene C, gene B, gene C, and so on and so on. They can cross a plasma membrane into the cell where they can be, um, a gene can be taken up into the chromosome, that's a chromosome there, marine chromosome, of a, of a bacteria that's received that piece of DNA. And in some cases, that piece of um, that chromosomal, uh, that chromosome can now acquire a new gene or genes such as B, gene B that you see here in capitals. Um, sometimes bacteria can uh, have a more uh, direct physical contact. So two bacteria can come a lot, can, can come together and via sex plus uh, actually transfer um, a gene directly in. So for example, you have a bacteria here that has like, so called an F positive cell and can conjugate with an F negative cell. F is some factor, plasmid, gene or whatever. We don't care at the stage. You can see here the F factor of this plasmid can transfer into the, into, the, into the target cell we see here and then replicate itself. So both uh, cells contain this F positive plasmid. Here's actually a micrograph, a rather um, amazing, uh, in my view, uh, scanning electron micrograph of two bacteria caught in the act of uh, having a horizontal gene transfer, bacterial sex, if you will. Now here's a sex pillus, when which the uh, one of the bacteria is injecting DNA into the other. Not entirely unlike mammalian sex, you might argue. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, kind of the biological view. Now we need to drill down a bit and try and understand these resistant mechanisms at a mole more molecular, molecular level. And the first look at resistance to the beta-lactam drugs. We've looked at beta-lactams in some detail, remember the penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, etc. We'll be discussing in the last lecture, beginning of this lecture. Um, and in general, uh, you have a number of uh, approaches to uh, beta-lactam resistance. Uh, particularly in the gram-negative bacteria, where you have this outer membrane, so this, this cartoon here would be a gram-negative because you have this outer plasma membrane, this outer lipid membrane. Um, it's the porins, which are whole, which are pore, kind of pore, pores, pore protein, proteinaceous pores in the outer membrane, um, allow influx of drugs or of material inside the cell. So alteration of a porin influx can be a direct way of um, of reducing access of uh, of um, uh, antibiotics to the target transpeptidase, which they try to inhibit. A second mechanism is a direct uh, modification of the transpeptidase enzyme. Um, remember, we also call transpeptidase penicillin binding protein um, uh, to make it let to give it less affinity for beta lactam drugs. And that's an example. We'll look at this example when you look at MRSA in a short while. The third possibility is direct enzymatic inactivation of the drug. And there's an enzyme called beta-lactamase, which chomps up various beta-lactams, such as penicillinase, cephalosporinase, um, and the expend, extended spectrum beta-lactamase, ESBL, um, all of which are enzymes which, uh, when they see the beta-lactams, they, they um, basically chew them up and inactivate them. So the second example there is the alteration of a, of a target. And a good example of this, as I already said, is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, also known, also known as MRSA. It's a very, uh, um, well, was a relatively famous uh, example of bacterial resistance back in the 2000s. Uh, thousands of people in the UK were dying from MRSA infections in hospitals. Um, it was um, it's largely, um, it's not disappeared, but it's become less of a problem due to better, uh, better hygiene. Um, it's a good example of where hygiene, particularly hand hygiene, has a very positive effect on uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, so Staph aureus is one of the most important uh, clinical pathogens. Um, we, all of us, uh, at different times, probably carry it. Um, it lives particularly in the nose, um, lives in your GI tract, you know, up your bum, 
in the peroneal region, that's around your bum, and in some cases in your throat. And it has this classic dip like uh, this kind of grape like structure. It's formed about 30% of adults carry it in their nose, 20% persistently, 60% occasionally, 20% never. And it's not really understood why some people carry it, some don't. And in most cases, people can carry staphylococcus aureus in the nose, for example, or other bits of their body with no ill effect. So anywhere it gets to where it's not wanted, it can cause problems such as wounds and other bits of your body. And nosocomial, nosocomial is a posh way of saying hospital transmission. It's a funny word, I don't know where it comes from. So the main hospital transmission of staphylococcus aureus is via hand carriage. That means people having it on their hands or wiping it on surfaces such as curtains or other people and then picking it up and it gets transferred that way. Uh, this cartoon is um, perhaps a rather busy cartoon, but it's taken from a really quite an excellent paper, which if you're interested in this area, it's worth having a, um, having a gaze at by, by, by Tim Foster, General Clinical Investigation 2004. And it's a cartoon really showing um, what the MRSA bacteria looks like. And what the important thing to note about MRSA is that the chromosomal DNA that we see there, wound around there, has a special gene called the SCC MEC. It's actually a collection, it's a cassette, in fact, containing a number of different genes. And part of what SCC MEC contains is a gene called MEC A. That's that fellow here. I'll just give a little arrow so you find it here. Now, what MEC A does, it encodes for a gene called PBP2A. And the clue there is in the name. Remember, PBP was penicillin binding protein, that's our standard. If you like wild type penicillin binding protein, penicillin binding protein 2A is a variant that does the same job within the cell, it helps to build cell, cell wall, but it has a very low affinity for all the beta lactam drugs. So the point about MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or particularly I should say the MECA gene, this whole class of antibodies, they're not just resistant to methicillin, they're resistant to almost all the beta lactam drugs. And that's a big problem because the beta-lactam drugs are a huge class of antibiotics still extensively used in hospitals. I should also say that this SEC MEC, it was believed was acquired um, originally via phage um, infection. Phages are small viruses which infect bacteria. And it's believed that this SEC MEC, this cassette that contains the MEC-A gene, was transferred via viral transmission. And we will look at more. We will look at more phages um, uh, in um, probably lecture five. So this is a, some again another graph from a European CDC, and it shows epi epidemiological data. In this case, the bad guys of us are the uh, southern European states, Portugal particularly bad. Um, I believe now the, um, the data for Balkans is also not looking good, or Bulgaria. UK is okay. We were one of the worst um, in 2004. We're now kind of moderate. Still very good in Scandinavia, um, particularly Norway and Sweden. Okay. What the current state of play is, I'm not sure. MRSA has become less of a problem um, due to, thanks really due to better hygiene, but it's still there and it's still a concern. So in some ways you might argue the MRSA story is a good news story, but, um, but um, we can um, we can do something about uh, uh, about antibiotic resistance. In some cases, it's just uh, boring, tedious, everyday measures like washing your hands better and better hygiene. The next class of, of um, resistance uh, at a kind of uh, molecular level are the drugs, oh, not the drugs, sorry, the um, enzyme called the beta-lactamases I've already discussed. As I said, these are enzymes produced, produced by bacteria which deactivate beta-lactam antibiotics. And we have this kind of structure here, which we will drill down into more detail. As I already said, they work by destroying beta-lactams. They target the four-membered ring here, open, up, open, it, open it up, and uh, we no longer have um, an active penicillin, beta-lactam. Um, in order for the enzyme to do its job, it needs access, of course, to the beta-lactam ring. So it was, actually, uh, it was actually considered that it might be possible to prevent beta-lactamase action by effectively putting kind of shielding groups 
around here. So therefore, it's basically to block block the uh, access of the beta lactamase enzyme, so to protect beta lactam ring. And this is actually this is the approach actually was taken quite successfully. Here's some examples. Okay. Um, and it's important because actually 90% of Staphylococcus aureus produce beta lactamase, um, and uh, it's a problem, of course, not just in uh, in the penicillins but also cephalosporins um, and other beta lactam drugs. And it's believed that 30% of all Staphylococcus strains are resistant to methicillin, and methicillin is a problem as well. Um, so this is actually methicillin. So this methicillin was the first drug really developed or discovered that was resistant to, um, to, the, to beta lactam enzymes. And the way it's uh, believed to be uh, um, resistant is by basically a kind of steric shielding effect. We've got these methyl, methyl groups here, methoxy here, and methoxy here, and it's believed these shields the beta lactam ring from uh, uh, penicillin ACE, which is another word for beta lactamase. The problem is um, these Methoxic is not electron withdrawing, so methicillin must, if it's effective, it's susceptible to acid um, uh, acid hydrolysis. So it can't, can't be given orally, it has to be given by IV. And so a number of, of drugs were developed using the same kind of um, steric shielding concept, but with electron withdrawing properties such as oxacillin, cloxacillin, and flucoxacillin. And all these drugs are used clinically uh, um, and extensively um, even now. So, in summary, by providing steric shielding, for example, these groups here, combined with electron withdrawing groups, you both confer a, a reasonable degree of beta lactamase resistance, um, and you also uh, allow the bacteria to be uh, um, acid stable. Okay, um, as a different approach to beta lactamase um, uh, or beta lactamase uh, prevention. Is, in, is to inhibit the enzyme directly. So rather than shield its access, which is not always possible, it's actually prevent it, um, is to prevent it doing its thing. Um, so the concept here is to make a separate drug which can be co-administered with your antibiotic, which specifically inhibit the enzyme, the beta lactamase enzyme. Um, and there's a, num there's a number of different uh, possibilities. Olivanic acid, which is first isolated from streptomyces, is a potent anti-lactamase, that's a potent anti-lactamase anti um, and it has this basic structure here, which you probably know is very similar to the uh, uh, to the uh, penicillins or other beta lactam drugs. In, in that, it contains this beta lactam ring here, um, and that is almost how it works. It, uh, it's, it's mistaken by beta lactamase for as a beta lactam, and uh, um, uh, inactivates the drug, in, inactivates the enzyme in the process. A further example is so-called clavulanic acid. Again, I said from another streptomyces strain, um, slightly different structure, but still we see, of course, the beta lactam structure here. Don't get too bogged down in the detail here, but it's, uh, it's uh, again, unsurprising that you see this beta lactam structure. What's the mechanism? It's believed what happens is Clavulanic acid and um, other variants uh, bind in the binding site of um, uh, the beta lactamase and basically block its um, uh, access to uh, beta lactam. So, if this is beta lactamase, that's the active binding site where, uh, where the, um, uh, the antibiotic would bind but be, uh, has higher affinity for clavulanic acid or other inhibitors. And it probably forms some kind of direct covalent linkage across the binding site, giving irreversible blocking of the enzyme to the antibiotic. So therefore, it can no longer um, bind to beta lactam. Beta lactam can, can, no, can no longer get in there. So let's try and write that there. Lactam, and it can't get in. Okay. And this combination therapy is, is, is used um, ex ex extensively. Um, uh, and indeed, some of you may have had a, 
may, may well have had antibiotic here's an example of amoxicillin you see it says amoxicillin which is of course a, a beta lactam um, 500 milligrams combined with potassium clavulin, clavulinate 125 milligrams and it's an effective uh, combination therapy the re-inhibitor and the antibiotic just briefly and don't this is a, a pretty terrible uh, diagram, which I apologise, but you should be aware there are other drugs which act on bacterial cell wall synthesis, as well as the beta lactams. And just name a few here: vancomycin, we already discussed, is involved on the outer cell membrane, uh, uh, and it inhibits um, the translation of uh, the transfer of peptides along the chain. Um, cycloserine is um, also on the inside of the cytoplasm, cytoplasmic side of a membrane and then there's bacteriocin here also um, affects uh, the transfer of lipids through the cell membrane. I won't discuss this in more detail now as we don't really have time but just be aware that um, it's not only beta lactams but other drugs as well can have this uh, inhibition, cell wall inhibition effect. Just briefly vancomycin already discussed as an example of a drug that absolutely does not obey Lipinski's uh, rules. Um, it's quite an interesting drug. It's a tricyclic glycopeptide, it's been around since 56. Um, and uh, although it's a natural product, currently it's um, much more pure than it used to be, and therefore gives uh, fewer adverse effects than the, the older versions. Um, it was stopped, stopped being used for a long time due to the introduction of other penicillins and other lactams. But the emergence of, uh, of uh, beta-lactam resistant drugs or methicillin resistant drugs, um, sorry, with the emergence of uh, beta-lactam resistant bacteria, not drugs but bacteria, um, vancomycin is now used in the clinic. Um, it's fairly toxic and it's used as a last line of defence. Uh, it's not um, an ideal drug for everyday use and clinicians prefer not to use it if they can avoid it and it's nephrotoxic it targets for kidneys and that's again the structure again and briefly it, it binds to the dialanine dialanine part of cross like nicking peptide um, and prevents this uh, cross-linking reaction taking place okay um i want to give a, another little uh, uh aside here but to talk about an important um, subclass of beta lactases, the metallo beta lactamases. These are emerging, this is an emerging problem. I first really discovered um, probably perhaps 10 years ago now with NDM1 New Delhi metallo protease. Um, let's just talk a little bit about the beta lactamases generally are ancient enzymes. Um, the carbapenemase producing enterobacteria are one of the most concerning. Um, into the bacteria, our bacteria live in your gut, um, and carbo, they're quite hard to kill. Carbapenem has long while been the antibiotic last re resort, but uh, acquisition of this uh, um, of these uh, metallo beta lactamase enzymes um, is a serious cause of concern. And there's a reference here you might want to read from 2005. So what is an MB or is a metallo um, uh, beta lactamase, um, they hydrolyze almost all beta lactams. They are uh, uh, they have alpha beta folds. Don't know too much about biochemistry. They are, contain zinc ions, interestingly. Um, and then we'll look at the uh, um, look at the structure in a short moment. Um, they are can either be chromosomally encoded, that means the gene uh, can uh, be um, uh, found on the bacterial direct from a bacterial chromosome, or you can have small plasmids uh, contained within the bacteria. Plasmids are, are small rings of DNA, which again contain the information. The most famous example is the New Delhi, New Delhi metalloproteases, um, or beta-lactamase, I should say. It's often called NDM of a New Delhi, New Delhi metalloprotease. Beta-lactamase is really exactly the same thing. Um, there's different alleles you see here, depending where uh, we have substitutions in the amino acid sequence. It lives in the periplasm of gram-negative bacteria between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. 
and it's extremely effective at chomping up um, any beta lactams that should come along uh, uh, into, the, into the bacteria. This mode of action is interesting. Um, here is your beta lactam target. It's believed that the zinc ions that you see here in yellow and here uh, coordinate via water the, um, the actual uh, beta lactam carbonyl here uh, via the zinc directly and via, the, via water to the carbon on the carbonyl here and the second zinc onto the neighboring carboxylic acid group on the side ring here. Um, and they allow essentially ring opening to take place on the on the beta on the beta lactam thus inactivating it. Epidemiology um, it's endemic in Pakistan and India. Uh, NDM also that's New Delhi where it's first found but is sporadically found uh, throughout most of the world including the UK, Europe, US, uh, China, Australia. This is NDM producing Klebsiella pneumoniae. And one of the concerns about NDM, the NDM1 gene, is it's a so called jumping gene. It can jump very easily between species. So bacterial species can acquire this gene from other bacteria, which are quite different, but different species, different strain, with great ease, and thus really making them uh, much more difficult to eradicate. However, inhibitors have been found that do appear to work or has much efficacy against. Uh, uh, um, the uh, metallo uh, beta lactamase uh, um, against metallo beta lactamases, sacroboronates, thyresters, metal collators, um, essentially molecules which uh, bind to zinc. As you will not be surprised if you can bind to zinc and remove zinc from the uh, uh, from the enzyme, you have a good chance potentially of reducing its effect. Uh, and again, uh, thyresters. Uh, have been shown to be pretty effective. The final groups collate zinc to form a disulfide bond and that appears to inhibit the uh, uh, it, um, be effective. Okay. 